Avatar The Last Airbender is widely regarded as one of the best animated shows of all time. With its stunning visuals, intricate power system, and interesting characters, Avatar possesses everything you need to have an incredible and successful show. At the center of the cast is Team Avatar. This unit of benders covering all the elements, water, earth, fire, air, and backs, rescued the world from the tyranny of the Fire Nation and helped to maintain peace in the world of Avatar for decades after. And in my last three videos, Team Avatar faced challenges in the Naruto world, ranging from the Chunin exams to facing off against the Akatsuki's monster duo. However, to put a bow on this Avatar x Naruto What If type series, Team Avatar will be facing off against arguably their greatest challenge yet. While our team of benders has the strongest person in their world on the team, Avatar Aang, in this video, we'll be forced to ask ourselves, what is an avatar to a god? That's because today, we'll be exploring and breaking down Team Avatar vs. Pain. In order to get an understanding of how Team Avatar would match up against Pain, we first need to establish a few things. Who's on the team, what's the situation, and what does the scaling look like? To answer the first question, Team Avatar will be comprised of Aang, Katara, Toph, and Zuko. This will be the 16 to 18 year old versions of them that we get in the comics, so those feats will be considered. I would love to have the backbender Sokka here, but he's kinda useless in this scenario and I don't want to write another Sokka death, so that's our unit. In terms of the situation, we'll be placing Team Avatar in Naruto's position during the pain attack, so this battle scenario will start right after the chaotic Shinra Tensei. Team Avatar's objective will be simply to stop Pain from killing everyone and going after Naruto, but there is a twist that will come into play once we get into the story. Finally, in terms of scaling, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, so we'll just keep it simple. Like the other high tiers of the Akatsuki, Pain is generally considered to be somewhere between high relativistic and slightly FTL. Nagato is able to put his focus on individual paths to specifically amp them individually, but never to an absurd degree that requires me to dig into it too much. Just know that the paths of pain can range from high relativistic to a bit above light speed. I know that there are calcs out there getting them as high as like 50x FTL, but I see those as outliers, and I think it's more consistent that the light speed mark in terms of combat speed begins getting eclipsed consistently with the high tiers closer to the war arc. Obviously, there are specific jutsu like Haku's Ice Mirrors and Itachi's Water Fang Bullet that are stated to allow for light speed attacks, but those seem to be special circumstances as Sasuke believes that a light speed Kirin is impossible to dodge in the same arc that we're taking pain from. So again, reaction slash combat speed is around light speed for pain, but not massively higher in my opinion. As far as the scaling for Team Avatar, we'll just use the same scaling that I used in my last video. Essentially, the way that Iroh describes lightning bending, which you can read on screen, more accurately describes how the return stroke of lightning functions as opposed to the downstroke, so we can use a highball interpretation to get them to a floor of high lightning timer levels or one-third light speed. Since Zuko and Aang both react to and outspeed this lightning more than once, especially in the comics, they safely scale above this level by a decent degree, putting them at high relativistic to light speed plus. Since Katara and Toph regularly show scaling relative to Zuko and Aang, you know, Aang not in the Avatar state, of course, it's safe to get them to that level of combat speed as well. Again, this is a high-end interpretation, but it is still valid due to the way that Iroh describes lightning bending. If you don't think that this scaling is where it actually needs to be, that's fine. You can go with the low-end interpretation of low lightning timer levels, like I used in my Avatar Team Avatar vs. the Chunin Exams video, which puts them at a floor of Mach 587, and in that case, they just get absolutely obliterated. However, since I, along with many others, am curious as to how this battle would go in a bit of a more equalized speed setting, we're gonna go with the high-end interpretation here. That said, it is about time that we dig into exactly how this matchup would go. But first, if you are enjoying yourself or enjoy this type of content, and you want to see more Avatar Naruto crossover content here on this channel, feel free to like and subscribe. You know, unless you're a terrorist. In that case, no need to like or sub. The FBI will be keeping track of that on this video so we can find you. But without any further ado, let's jump into our epic story. 
Just outside of Konoha awaits an enemy that has been terrorizing the shinobi world, the de facto leader of the Akatsuki and the one responsible for the death of Jiraiya, the Six Paths of Pain. Finally ready to enact his plan and bring it to fruition, the wielder of the Rinnegan makes his move. In a puff of smoke, the paths appear inside of the village and scatter individually, but with two separate groups effectively. One group is tasked with gathering intel on the whereabouts of Naruto, and the other is tasked with causing mass destruction and chaos throughout the village in order to allow for the recon group to move more freely. Everything proceeds as it did in the original timeline, except our team of benders shows up right when when Naruto did. You could say maybe they're just getting back from a mission or something if you want to, you know, rationalize it. But just like Naruto, the team arrives a moment too late, riding on Appa. They look on at the devastation for a moment before Aang says, let's go. A blood-curdling scream from Sakura breaks out as she screams for Naruto, but in this timeline, Konoha's message never reaches Naruto, and he never comes to the village. In this timeline, instead of a puff of smoke and some toads, we get Appa flying in and landing right in front of the Paths of Pain. Pain looks on as Aang and his team leap off of the flying bison, and Aang asks what in the world happened. Tsunade explains everything, and gives each of the members a mini Katsuyu, just like Naruto had. They inform the team of the Shinra Tensei cooldown, as well as the abilities of each path of Pain. Aang shouts at Pain that he's going to stop him here and now, and he's going to keep him from pursuing Naruto. But Pain then remarks that he has no need for the nine-tailed fox, when Aang possesses something even greater. Pain would sense Rava. Angered by the devastation he sees before him, Aang would say, If you want my power, come and take it. Pain versus Team Avatar. Our epic battle begins now. I'll be completely honest with you guys, this battle is super hard to discuss because there are so many moving parts. So, I will work into a story like, you know way of telling this, I suppose, but we do need to kind of go into how their abilities would work against one another in this scenario. So let's start with something that I think is hilarious. Toph could unironically solo. Now, the reason I say that is because the black receiver rods appear to be metal. Since Toph can pull metal through the air to herself and transfigure it into a liquid and any shape or object that she wants, since she can literally fix an engine that's broken without ever touching it just using her mind and metal bending, I think she could literally just pull Payne's rods out of the bodies and call it good. And I don't believe that there's an exact distance given for how far away from Konoha Nagato was, but since Toph tells Sokka that she essentially can bend any metal that he's able to see, this would give her a metal bending range of 3 kilometers, or as far as the human eye can see human sized objects. So hypothetically, since we know that she can sense metal in her surroundings as well as distinguish between different types of metals in the comics, she might be able to sense the same type of metal that the Rinnegan rods are made of and find where Nagato is. If that happens, I see a scenario in which Aang takes away Nagato's ability to use chakra. So Nagato is stopped, but everyone who's dead stays dead. However, I don't like that because it feels too anticlimactic for a Team Avatar vs. Pain video, so we'll be assuming that the rods are not made of metal. They're never actually stated to be, they just have metal-like properties, so I think this is fair. And that said, all the pads of Pain do wear headbands, which have metal on them. Now, I'll give them another break and just say that they know about the metal bender Toph and don't bring their headbands. And we'll also give them another break and assume that the apparently metal structures created by the Osiropath are not actually metal, but some non-metal, metal-like substance. So, uh, while Toph likely would be able to solo if we didn't give all of these breaks, we'll give Pain a fair shot here. But with that said, how do the abilities of Team Avatar match up with the Six Paths of Pain? Let's just get this out of the way. Katara is literally out of her element here. You could say that maybe she pulls the sweat from everyone in the village that's been leveled, but the area is so wide that I'm not sure. I mean, maybe she's a powerful and you know precise enough bender to do that. I think there's a good argument for that, but I don't want to get too far into headcanon area. Since the village has been leveled, there also aren't any plants for her to pull from, so she's just got her basic pouch of water. Due to this, I think it's fair to assume that she'd just hang back a bit and provide light support and medical if needed, but Aang certainly would not want her going in essentially empty-handed against an opponent who just leveled a village. 
It's also worth noting that aside from Toph's metal bending and Aang in the Avatar state, they'll likely have a really difficult time dealing significant damage to the stronger paths, namely the Diva and Asura paths. However, the other paths can be put out of commission fairly easily. I will say, I don't think that Team Avatar would make the same mistake Naruto did in forgetting that the Naraka path can revive the other paths, so I do believe they'd probably try to go after that path first. They'd also have an easier time dealing with the shared vision aspect of the Path of Pain due to the fact that it's 6 versus 4 and not 6 versus 1. But obviously, Pain isn't going to just allow for Team Avatar to take out their healer instantly, so I believe this battle would start in the same way that the one with Naruto did. The, the Animal Path would summon the massive Rhino and try to take them down quickly, and this is where I believe we'd get to see the giant stone golem that Aang uses against General Iron in the comics. He goes into the Avatar state, forms the golem, and catches the Rhino like Naruto. However, instead of throwing it, I think Aang would just blast it with a punch, knocking it down and possibly out of commission, because, you know, if they take enough damage, they just poof. You see, Aang used this form in a battle against a powerful spirit that could casually destroy whole cities, and Aang had to hold back because he didn't want to kill him, which he actually ended up doing in the end. But, yeah, so, so this form should be enough to handle the Rhino, but what then? After the Rhino, just like the original story, the Animal Path would summon the Ox and the Duplicating Dog. Now, this would be an issue. Uh, the Ox would be dealt with easily enough with Aang's Stone Golem or Avatar State Bending attacks, which easily scale to island level plus, but the Duplicating Dog would be an issue. It's worth pausing here for a second to mention that the other Paths of Pain would just be spectating at this point, since that's what they did in their fight against Naruto at this point. Uh, but part of the reason for that is likely because the Diva Path is still recovering from the chaotic Shinra Tensei. But yeah, I just thought that would be worth noting. So nobody's like, well, what are the other Paths of Pain doing? So, that being said, how would they deal with the duplicating dog? Well, they'd likely try to take it down with their bending, you know, Zuko sending fire blasts at it, Toph hitting with stones, etc., but that would just cause it to duplicate again and again. Eventually, though, whether it be by the advice of Katsuyu or they just figure it out, they'd surely realize that taking out the animal path, the summoner, would actually do the trick. And this is where our MVP of the last video and, you know, pretty much everything, Toph, comes into play. Before the Animal Path could get off another summon, I believe that Toph would bury the Animal Path into the earth and crush her. Now, you may be saying, but Sage, they don't kill. Yeah, well, they would be aware that these are technically corpses because Naruto was as well. So, we'd actually get to see Team Avatar go all out here, which is terrifying. That said, with the Animal Path taken care of, I believe they'd turn their attention back to the Naraka Path. In the fight against Naruto, the Paths of Pain protected the Naraka and Diva Paths early in the fight, hiding them in the back, so they'd likely do the same here. However, Team Avatar has something that Naruto didn't have, bending. Now, you may be saying, well isn't that just like ninjutsu? Not really. As one of my faithful subscribers pointed out, casual reminder to like and sub, bending is actually more like senjutsu than ninjutsu. This is because, aside from Zuko and Aang's fire, they're not actually creating the stuff that they bend with their chi, or chakra because verse equalization. The water, earth, and air that they are bending is literally them manipulating the natural elements around them. So, much like Jigen couldn't absorb the real flames that Kashin Koji summoned, the Renegon also cannot absorb natural elements, only chakra-based attacks. And this is where that becomes incredibly important. After dealing with the animal summons and the summoner, Team Avatar would rush towards the Paths of Pain together, with the Prey to Path jumping in front of them just like he did in the original timeline. Katsuyu would tell the team that this one can absorb chakra, to which Aang would say, no problem, and absolutely bolo him with an island level gust of airbending. Because he's running at him, I think this is the perfect time for him to use the ridiculously sick attack that he uses when he runs and then airbends his own silhouette at Zuko whenever he's fighting him in season 2 or 3, I think. In the Avatar state, this is absolutely rocketing the Preta path out of the battlefield. And this is another instance in which Toph is probably playing cleanup and burying and crushing the Preta path. Two down, four to go. In the original timeline, this is exactly where Naruto ran out of Sage Mode and the Diva Path chased after him, giving the Naraka path a chance to restore the other two paths that have been taken down. However, that's not happening here. Team Avatar steams ahead. 
but here's where it gets tough. Since they've gotten it down to four, I could see a scenario in which they just break off into four 1v1s, but A, I don't think Payne would want that because the Diva Path is still weakened and he can't risk letting the Naraka Path fall, and B, Team Avatar is likely to stick to their objective of getting to the Naraka Path. So, it's not neat and tidy, but very chaotic, and honestly, I think this is where the story diverts pretty heavily from the original. With the Asura, Naraka, Human, and Diva paths the only ones left standing, we really only have two combat effective paths on the field, and they need to buy more time for the Diva to regain his power, and one of them is the Diva. So, the Asura path steps in and fires a bunch of rockets at our team of benders. Had we not given them the benefit of the doubt earlier, Toph would just bend these rockets and crush them, but we're assuming that these very likely metal objects are not metal, so I see a scenario in which instead, Aang and Toph erect an earth wall to shield themselves from the rockets. Considering the fact that Toph's earth barriers can block firebending attacks from Avatar State Aang, I see no reason why these rockets would get through. Once the explosions hit, they'd likely break the wall apart and launch the pieces of the wall at a high velocity at the pads of pain. With a similar attack to what I'm talking about here, Toph was able to harm Aang while holding back because obviously she didn't want to kill him. Now, he's totally on guard here too, so it's not like an off-guard durability thing. This is the same Aang who survived being hit by the firebending attack Ozai used to break through his stone defense. Now, keep in mind, the stone in Avatar is tough enough to not get instantly vaporized by Aang's airbending, which should scale to Kyoshi's, and Kyoshi was able to move an island with hers. So, if this projectile can wound Aang while Toph was holding back, a similar attack with both Aang and Toph going all out absolutely levels the remaining paths. Except for the Diva Path. Now, it might sound like they're just running through these paths of pain, and they kind of are, but you also have to keep in mind that this is a team of high-level benders that all have, you know, that relativistic speed scaling, they've all got great AP, all that good stuff, so, and it's kind of being carried by Aang and Toph, who, in terms of, like, their combat potential are probably the two best in this scenario because Katara doesn't have a bunch of water to work with. So, you know, I understand if somebody feels kind of hesitant about the way that this fight is going, but just keep in mind that these people are like, you know, city block plus to island plus level benders, and they have relativistic plus levels of speed, and it's not a 1v6 like it was in the original. But, like I said, the Diva Path does not get leveled, because it's at this point in the fight that the Diva Path would regain its power, using a small Shinra Tensei to dispel the stone projectiles. Zuko, Aang, and Toph would then try to capitalize on, on the Shinra Tensei cooldown, but to no avail. Nagato would focus his chakra onto the last remaining and most powerful path, allowing for him to narrowly dodge the assault, just like he narrowly dodged six-tailed Naruto's Bijudama. As he peeked his head out of the smoke, stone would encase his feet, immobilizing him. A barrage of shuriken that were scattered around the battlefield from the initial invasion would be hurled at pain by Toph, as another set of elemental blasts from Zuko and Aang came hurling in. But it would be too late. Pain would use another Shinra Tensei, but this time, it would be more powerful. Powerful enough to shatter the Toad Summon's bones. The team would be able to erect some sort of defense, but it would likely not make it in time. Aang, Katara, Zuko, and Toph would be blasted backward, and only one of them would stand. The Avatar. Aang, being saved by the Avatar State Dome he travels around in, would go to check on his friends and make sure that they were breathing. But suddenly, he'd start getting pulled backward. He'd turn midair to face Pain, who would catch him by the throat, choke slamming him into the ground. Aang would hack as the glow from the arrow on his forehead flickered, and Pain would raise his hand, creating a Rinnegan rod, and stab downward. As the Rinnegan rod traveled downward toward Aang, he'd take a deep breath and scream. The gust of wind from his scream would blast Pain hundreds of feet into the air, where he'd flail for a second before getting his composure and levitating. Aang would look over to his friends, who would be laying on the ground being healed by Katsuyu. He'd sigh in relief as he saw Katara's eyes open, and then turn to face his foe. The Avatar State Dome would return as Avatar Aang raises off the ground into the air to meet his opponent. 
Payne would say something like, In this world, all there is is pain. Once I unify the world under shared pain, the world will know peace. So don't take this personally, Avatar, but I'll be taking that spirit now. Payne would then clasp his hands together and release a black orb. The black orb would fly above them and Payne would go back down to the ground as the rubble beneath him and around him would begin getting pulled upward toward the orb. Payne with his hands clasped would scream and put all of his power into his trump card, the Chibaku Tensei. With stone flying past him, Aang would try to get back to the diva path, but an overwhelming amount of stone would begin to get in his way. One after another, large chunks of rubble would knock into Aang's avatar bubble, knocking him off course. So Aang would decide that if he can't get to pain, he'll bring pain to him. Summoning the power of the strongest earthbending avatar of all time, Aang would channel Kyoshi. Tightening his core and raising his hand into the air, Aang would forcefully bring the ground beneath pain up at a rapid speed. You see, in the Rise of Kyoshi novel, Kyoshi raises a mountain-sized landmass from the ocean floor up above sea level in order to fend off an enemy. So, I believe that Aang would do the same here. This mountain of earth would come hurling upward at Aang, who would just begin rushing full speed towards pain. Pain would be accelerated so quickly that he couldn't stand, but the Jibaku Tensei would still be taking up the bulk of his power, so he'd be unable to do anything, just hoping that the rubble catches Aang and pulls him into the orb. Aang and his avatar state would just be eviscerating all of the stone coming at him and crash into pain at a high velocity, driving him down through the mountain of earth with an elemental charge that we've never seen before. The mountain beneath Pain would be decimated as Aang's overwhelming might powered through it, slamming Pain into the base of the mountain. A shockwave would blast out in all directions, and dust would fly. But once the dust settled, we'd see a swirling ball of earth, fire, and air hovering above the ground. Aang would look down at his vanquished opponent, victorious. Team Avatar wins, high difficulty. <laughs> So Team Avatar gets the victory, defeating each of the Paths of Pain. However, I'm not sure that they'd be able to find Nagato. Maybe you could argue that Aang's energy bending would allow for him to sense the flow of energy, which would then lead him to Nagato, but I'm not sure. If that does happen, he might be able to talk no jutsu Nagato because he and Naruto are pretty similar in that way, but Naruto was like 65 wilt with that stuff, so I don't think so. I think it's more likely that Aang just takes away Nagato's abilities for killing so many people and, you know, plotting world domination. Kind of sounds like Ozai to me. But this means, though, that everyone who died, including my glorious King Kakashi, stays dead. But it also means that Kurama and Rava remain unsealed, and Obito may not get the Rinnegan. That said, that is the video, and the conclusion to my Avatar x Naruto crossover series, at least for now. I do plan on doing more Avatar crossover videos, including things like Aang and Naruto swap fights, but next week, I have a very special video. Next week, we're venturing into new territory with a battle of monsters, specifically the king of the monsters. That's right, next week we have Godzilla versus the Tailed Beasts. I'm super excited and I hope you are as well. But that's it for this video, so if you enjoyed, feel free to drop a like, as I greatly appreciate it. If you didn't, I'm sure you'll let me know in the comments. And also, if you're looking forward to next week's video or just more content like this, make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss out when new content drops. That said, I'd like to say thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. Have an awesome day.